Welcome to the New Church Podcast. It is time once again for all of us to consider making New Year resolutions. Like go to the gym, eat healthier, stop smoking, drink more water and less of everything else. Either improve our work-life balance or completely destroy it so we can be more successful at work. Small business owners resolving to grow their business base. Isn't that like saying, I resolve to make more money this year? Wow. Groundbreaking. Who would have thought of that? CEOs resolving to increase innovation and growth probably just means having more meetings to figure out how to have less meetings. People are going to make all kinds of resolutions to spend more time with their kids, to have date nights, to read a book on how to stop being a terrible person, to find a book that can explain how to stop being a terrible person, to give away copies of that book to all the terrible people that you know and wonder what it means if people give that same book to you. (laughs) Or since we're in church, some people, I believe, will make Jesus-focused resolutions like pray more, read the entire Bible all the way through this year, go to church more often, make sure your kids grow up in church, Join one of the small group Bible studies that we got going around here. Stay awake during the sermon at least once a month, which would be ambitious for some. So last year I had a few New Year resolutions, and I'm actually still doing them. I resolved to get up early, pray, and go to the gym first thing in the morning before I do anything else. Still doing it, a year later. I know. Is there a cash prize for keeping a New Year's resolution for a whole year? Is, I mean, I know exercise and prayer, those are their own reward. I get that. Still, if you hear about a cash prize. I'm thinking about skipping the gym part for the next two weeks, though. Just to let all the newbies get it out of their system and quit so I can go back to enjoying access to all the machines. Also, so I don't have to watch people strut around in their Christmas yoga pants, using all the equipment wrong. Skipping the gym for the next couple of weeks, it's it's really a public service, if you think about it. Plus, God will have a lot less to forgive me for because of all those critical thoughts that I would be having with people doing ridiculous acrobatic maneuvers on the squat machine, watching them destroy their knees and making long-term financial security for their future orthopedic surgeons. Not really though. I'm gonna keep going every day, Monday through Friday. Most people, they don't even last a week anyway, so it might be interesting to notice how quickly the resolution revolutionaries thin their ranks and we go back to all the usual faces. I'm pretty sure the main reason that I was able to keep last year's resolutions, keep them going, was because I told people I was going to do it. I mean that and I, I built it into my daily schedule I told my friends, my family, I even told people on social media what I was going to do, which means I was completely opening up myself to ridicule if I quit. Also, I told God what my intentions were. I prayed. I said, Lord, I want to make prayer and exercise top priority first thing in the morning. Would you please help me do that? And he did which isn't really surprising because he said he would. Proverbs 16.3 says, Commit to the Lord whatever you do, 
and he will establish your plans. That sounds a lot like New Year resolutions to me. So I've got a few ideas for you to consider adding to your New Year resolution plans. And two of them are not going to shock anyone in the room, not in the slightest. I mean, if I were to ask you to write down your guesses for what my suggestions were going to be, I think most of you would probably get the first two, no problem. So go ahead and just guess in your mind what you think my suggestions are going to be. Don't say them out loud. Just think them in your mind. I'll give you a second. <laughs> okay, so here are Pastor Frank's new church resolution suggestions. You ready? Number one, attend Sunday worship faithfully. Go to church. Number two, be faithful in your tithes and offerings. Anyone shocked at those? I mean, you probably think you know what the third one is, too. Something that involves the words read and freaking, right? <laughs> but you'd be wrong. I don't think anyone is going to be able to guess what the third resolution suggestion is going to be. Isaiah 43, 25 says this. It says, I, even I, am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake and remembers, remembers your sins no more. God says, I, even I, two emphatic confessions referring to who God is and what God does, two things that are inseparable, and he elevates the proclamation of these things above everything else. God is the one who blots out sins. God is the one who forgives sins completely for his own namesake. He promises not to remember your sins against you. Chapter 43 of Isaiah is a courtroom setting where God is the judge. So it's picturing a day when God will hear all the crimes against his people and then declare them not guilty because of the future Savior and Redeemer. So picture what's happening here. You are standing before God. You are. And all your sins, they are being brought into the light. The accuser, he is listing your sins one by one. And it's humiliating because you're guilty as, well, sin. You're as guilty as sin. But then God renders his verdict. He says the words that set you free. He looks at you and he says, not guilty. See, that's called performative language. Words that change things. Words that do something. Words that make something happen. It's not the same thing as descriptive language. Descriptive language would mean the judge is saying something like, so you know, as the judge, I have the power to forgive your sins, your crimes. If I just say the word, then you would be acquitted. Kind of like when preachers say something like, God sent Jesus into the world to die for sinners and to forgive sins, to save people, which is all true. But it's just describing it. It's just descriptive. It doesn't actually do it. It doesn't actually get it done. See, preachers need to be like that judge and use the power that they've been given to actually do it to make it happen, to say the verdict out loud, not guilty. Your sins are forgiven because of Jesus. Boom, done. You're free to go. There is no longer a problem between you and God. Your sins are remembered against you no longer. You see the difference between those two things? between descriptive and performative, the difference between giving theoretical information 
and creating a new reality. See, descriptive language says Jesus forgives sins. Performative language says your sins are forgiven. And Jesus told me to tell you that. See, that's how pastors, preachers, that's how they should be proclaiming the gospel. But most of them don't. Most of them, if they talk about the gospel at all, they just describe it. They don't do it. They don't give it. They don't apply it. They just kind of hold it up, admire it. But they never give it to the people who are there. But it's not just pastors and preachers that are supposed to be doing this. Jesus gave that same authority to all of his followers, to all of us, to all of you. In Matthew 16, 19, Jesus says this to his followers. He said, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. And if that's too hard, if that's too weird, if that's hard to understand because he uses the idea of keys to illustrate the power and authority that he's given to you. Well, listen to the same idea in the Gospel of John, chapter 20. Jesus tells his followers, If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. See, we have to actually do it. We have to actually say it. And if we neglect our duty, then it doesn't happen. Speaking in the name of Jesus, you have to forgive people's sins or they're not going to be forgiven. So this is my third New Year resolution suggestion. Use performative language to apply the gospel to the people God puts in your life. When someone says they're sorry, they tell you they're sorry for whatever reason, instead of just going, oh man, don't worry about it. That's no big deal. Or it's okay. Instead of those things, say this. Say, I forgive you. Instead of being passive about it, say, look, we all mess up sometimes. But thanks be to God. He's not going to hold this against you. And neither am I. And performative language, it also includes when we confess things, when we make a pledge, when we make a confession, when we say something like, I take thee, Kim, to be my lawfully wedded wife. See, that sentence right there, that changed things for me and for Kim. I now pronounce you husband and wife. Those aren't just words. Because after those words are spoken, you've got a new reality. And you're going to need to get a lawyer involved if you want to change that new reality. Performative language. So what does it mean to be Christian? You ever thought about that? What does it mean to be a Christian? And there's probably a few different ways to answer this question. But I would say that at the center, the most basic thing it means to be a Christian is that a person believes Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God who came to save the world and make peace between God and mankind. That's what it means to be a Christian. Romans 10.9, it says it like this. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead you will be saved. When you say and believe that Jesus is Lord, you're a Christian. Performative language. Once you say it, once you believe it, something changes. Everything changes. Now, there's a lifetime of details that are going to follow that simple confession. A lifetime of things to learn, to believe, to follow through on actions. But just like when you say, I do, in a wedding ceremony, something changed when you confessed that Jesus is Lord and believe 
that God raised him from the dead for you. That it means something for you. When you believe Jesus is your Lord and the resurrection was for you. So what does this have to do with New Year resolutions? Well, I want you to make a commitment to use performative language to apply the gospel to other people and also to yourself. Don't just talk about the gospel. Make the gospel happen. Like, say this out loud. Say, Jesus is Lord. Say that out loud. Jesus is Lord. How'd that feel? Did you mean it? Do you believe it? Say it again like you really mean it. Jesus is Lord. Man. I mean, we can change the world with a confession like that. You know that? What does it mean for us that Jesus is Lord? Well, it means at least two big things. It means he gets to tell us how to live our lives, what to do with our time, how to treat people, what to do with our talent and our money. If Jesus is Lord, then we are not our own Lord. Now, we can spend the rest of our lives trying to figure that out, get all that right, try to not sin, try to do what our Lord has told us to do. And none of us are going to be very good at it. But if we confess that Jesus is Lord, well, that means we believe he knows better than we do and his ways are better than our ways. But if Jesus is Lord, it means something else too. Man, it means something really important. If Jesus is Lord... It means we don't have a harsh Lord because Jesus is Lord and he's a loving Lord, a kind Lord, a forgiving Lord. He's patient with you. So he not only tells you what you ought to be doing, he forgives you when you don't do it. He not only has the authority and the power to forgive you, It also means he wants to forgive you. (laughs) Jesus is Lord means your sins are forgiven. And it was his idea to forgive you. He's God. He wanted to do it. Again, performative language. You say Jesus is Lord and you're saved. Boom. And when you tell other people their sins are forgiven because of Jesus and they hear you, and they believe you, well, then God forgives their sins too. And they're saved. So, I really want to encourage all of us to make saying performative statements about the gospel your top resolution this year. Like, wake up in the morning, tell Jesus that he's your Lord. First thing, start off that way. And then all through the day, like look for opportunities to find the least awkward ways possible to give people grace through your words. I mean, now and then someone's going to apologize to you and you're going to have this giant opening to just hit a home run, man. They say they're sorry and you get to say, I forgive you. There's no problem between you and me. And if you think they're a believer, then you can add this. And God forgives you too. It's all good. But you don't always have to be so potentially weird about things. You can just say things like, hey, I want to let you know, I see how hard you're working. Affirm people, however you can affirm them. However, you can validate them. Tell them they're making a big difference. Tell them you appreciate them. Or if they let you know about something that's going on in their life, some situation they're going through, don't just tell them that you'll pray for them, that they're in your prayers. Use that moment to make it happen. Maybe send them a prayer in a text that includes performative language like, 
God, I am so thankful that you care about my friend even more than I do. You love them and you want what's ultimately good for them. Let them know that they are forgiven, that they've been promised all the hope in the world because of Jesus. Or just be brave and drop everything and just pray with them right there and then on the spot. Wouldn't that be something? This performative language versus descriptive language, it's kind of a big Lutheran idea. No one quite puts the emphasis on it the way we do. It's probably the most important thing that distinguishes us from other Christian churches. Because other churches will tell you about the gospel, but the Lutheran idea is to actually apply the gospel in the sermon, in the sacraments. Make sure that they know it's for them, that it's for you, the listener. Like today, right after the sermon, we're going to celebrate Holy Communion, which I like to call our altar call. Because, you know, sometimes other churches will have this thing after the sermon where they encourage everyone to pray with every head bowed and every eye closed and no one looking around. And then they'll try to get people to raise their hand or stand or eventually what they want is they want people to come forward an altar call in response to the message. And the idea is that if people take a step toward confessing their faith, if they actually walk up to the front, then it's going to be more real, more meaningful to them. And I get it. I do. But it's not something we do here. Instead, we have an altar call that's for everyone. For everyone to come forward, receive forgiveness, receive salvation. Because we believe that the bread and the wine have the real presence of Christ's body and blood in a mysterious way, that somehow Jesus is truly present in, with, and under the bread and wine, and also that eating and drinking the bread and wine is a means of grace, that we actually receive the grace of God, the benefit of what Jesus did for us on the cross. We receive that in the Lord's Supper when the bread and the wine are offered with the words of promise. So the very act of eating and drinking is a way of receiving the promise of what those words said. It's performative. The act and the words do what they say. This bread is the body of our Lord given for you. This wine is his blood shed for the forgiveness of your sins. So eat and drink, knowing that you are forgiven because of Jesus. And even if you pass on the bread and the wine, you can still come forward to receive absolution, forgiveness of sins, through the performative words of grace. So we're going to do all that in a few minutes. Today is New Year's Eve. Tonight, the entire world will recognize that it has been 2,024 years since Jesus was here. There's going to be celebrations in every major city in the world, people of all walks of life, every religion, every confession and creed, everyone is going to bear witness whether they know it or not, whether they like it or not, they're all going to bear witness to the fact that Jesus Christ walked the earth 2,024 years ago. And a lot of resolutions are going to be made. So along with all the self-help, family, and career pledges, I would like you to consider adding three more. Number one, Attend Sunday worship faithfully. Number two, be faithful in your tithes and offerings. And number three, use performative language to apply the gospel to the people in your life. And don't just make those resolutions in a vacuum. Let people know 
what your intentions are. And say your resolutions out loud to the Lord in prayer. Proverbs 16.3 says, Commit to the Lord whatever you do, and he will establish your plans. So with the help of God, you can do this. Amen. For more information, go to newchurch.love or email frank at frankheart.com. If these online resources have been meaningful to you, please consider going to newchurch.love slash give and show your support by helping make this ministry possible. Thank you.